हार्टी वेलकम to this uh, 15th session of uh, south asian online literary conference uh, being conducted uh, by sahitya academy in collaboration with uh, foundation of sark writers and literature that is first one and uh, hello 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 namaste everybody good afternoon ajit kaur ji yeah in this uh, yeah. in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh session 15th session uh, we are going to have uh, dr arun gupta's conversation with uh, professor abhishubedi and uh, followed by hasan al jaid's conversation with professor fakrul alam and followed by then followed by uh, miss uh, uh, tatul uh, conversation with uh, mr ibrahim wahid now uh, at the same time i would like to bring to your kind notice that uh, each conversation is been allotted with uh, 15 minutes time so i request all the participant to kindly confine to the time and uh, 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 let me start with uh, dr arun gupta uh, his conversation with uh, professor abhishubedi ji and uh, i request uh, uh, prof uh, dr arun gupta ji to kindly uh, introduce yourself I also introduce uh, professor abhishubedi ji namaskar thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to professor subedi i am arun gupta i i i belong to the same department where i grew up as his student and later became his colleague and uh, so <clears throat> we belong to this uh, what professor subedi calls english mafia <laughs> so <laughs> uh let me welcome professor subedi since we have only 15 minutes time i will try to engage him on multiple issues and multiple subject matters contents i am familiar with with his work as colleague as a leader so uh professor dr b subedi is a poet dramatist critic columnist and one of the most influential member of the country he taught at central mm -hmm. department of english for many decades and he still teaches he writes in nepali and english baba his over yeah. baba that include essays plays poetry literary reviews and theories baba are published he is the founding former president of international theatre association am i think he was given sark literary award in 2010 he is my teacher and as an honor host of my documentary series on the arts of kathmandu professor subedi let me begin with a section from your collection of english poems chasing dreams uh, for me uh, i i'm going to concentrate more on his idea of flaneur and uh, how he weeps different personalities persona in his in his works particularly not only in his essays but also in his poems so let me begin with a beautiful line from chasing dreams one of my favorites and uh, uh, quote the sky is spread its storm into the open palms of the gods in the city and descended upon it i sat like the shattered sun in your dooryard is spreading my own words my time woven in them now professor subedi one of the most profound ideas are expressed in your nepali collection of essays flaneur ko diary or diary of a flaneur you write that the flaneur's walk in the city is the quest for palim 
obsessed writing upon writing in form of the arts looking to understand architecture sculpture painting music for instance does the flaneur still exist to know things by putting arms akimbo stand lazily on the pavements or it's a kind of extinct persona what is the loss if he or she does not exist in contemporary urban landscape so this is my query or this is my question um, to professor subedi there there are many there in question like a palimpsest as you said um i just want to read the second stanza uh, from the from the same poem that was yesterday i came to the city lost like a minuscule sky in the lanes of in the lanes crept out of my own lanes of memories and broke into a dawn under the collapsing roofs of the houses of the gods this poem was written especially recalling a day when on a sunny day suddenly there was a came a big storm in kathmandu and as though the sky was falling on the open palms of the god a big storm and incidentally on that day in the courtyard there were lots of hippies i was a kind of a hippie i wouldn't call a full blooded hippie but i was with them and they were spread all over the courtyard sunny colorful and so on and like the hippies i do am a I am an outsider in Kathmandu. So I, when I came to Kathmandu as a student, actually, I thought there are so many layers open up in the city: architecture, art, and so on. As you very rightly said, palimpsest effect. And my, I didn't have one fixed purpose. The only purpose, if there was any, was to to make a quest. The quest. So there are many. We, we don't have time. I don't want to go deep into that. But uh, the flanner, I guess. Um, as a bodelier saw way back in paris that is how the word came up and i gave the title to my nepali book also planner's diary so he must have also seen layers 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 in carpent in paris just like carmandu there is one side of it so i use this kind of a quest quest of the layers as you very rightly you made my life easy by saying this is a palimpsest effect and i set out on a quest for all that without any fixed purpose but with a strong stormy purpose in the second part of the uh, question is that um, whether a um, flanner exist or not what is a flanner flanner is a uh, person who continues to make a quest goes out in quest in search of the meaning in search of the solution and so on uh, so, so that is a kind of a very not violent but a very aggressive process of um, search for meaning in life uh, ajit didi is a is a flanner to, if, if, if i may use the terminology when she launched the shark organization many years ago i was there i'm always there and she said in before this uh, very eminent writer some of whom are dead now she said i am a mad woman didi perhaps remembers it is printed in the speech i am a mad woman that is why i set out to do this she is a flanner mahatma gandhi is a flanner he uses the style of the flanners without conforming to a kind of a very boring set of things going out in search of meaning more alternatives and so on so that is my favorite mode of quest and then um, just jump to you your third question because there is no time you said is there a flanner now i believe there is thana flanner does exist didi is still there you are there the bangladeshi friends are there from indian poets and friends are there the flanner exists people are who are out in quest of the meaning or in quest of the program where they involve themselves and then see the possibilities of doing something not any kind of a very fixed thing like for example you just said you are making a documentary talking and so on you are a flanner uh, i am a flanner so the flanner does exist in all cities 
And what will happen if Flanders disappears? That will be a disaster. I think a universe, a world where no Flanders exists will be a terrible world. There are many threats coming from different directions nowadays. The old, beautiful, architectural, artistic, literary sites, even the political, creative political sites, the freedom of expression and so on, all these things are coming under attack. So in these difficult times, if Flanners disappear, we should be very worried about that. But my conviction is that Flanner doesn't disappear. Even um, uh, so, that is that is that is my that is my point. Of, if you want to add uh, to this, you can uh, you can add your question to yeah. to this. Uh, this is a wonderful metonymic expansion of the idea of flaneur. Uh, means from that very literal flaneur in Paris to this wonderful symbolic or more metonymic, you know, expansion of the idea of flaneur. And that's why you said that Flaneur exists. Now, you being a Flaneur, I mean, I have walked with Professor Subedi in the lanes and streets of Kathmandu, and I mean, walked and walked and walked. So, and then one interesting, interesting, iconic, mythical figure you encounter while walking into the city. On that particular condition, means I have I have walked with you and I have seen you uh, performing that particular flanier, flanier hood or flanier ship. And why is the bull a very mythical figure present in urban landscape? In your essay writings, you be plots where you meet and converse with this ancient animal, the bull. In Nepali, it is the sari. And Kathmandu is very popular with sari or bull sitting in the middle of the streets. So why do you do that? What happens? Who is that bull? A mythical figure, an animal? What that symbol carries to you? What does it mean? Yes, that um, in Spanish they call toro, sare, a guru. Um, when I first came to Kathmandu as a student many years ago, um, I missed my countryside, my village. Everything looked strange to me, a city, everything was. And that animal I saw ambling over the streets, carefree, freely, with a big hump. Oh my, I, my, and I said, oh my God, he's there. That was my friend that reminded me of the nature from where I came. So I became his friend. That's the first thing. And then I uh, always kept uh, his company, the, the Sanedu, who walks freely, sleeps open under the stars and, and so on. And then um, the other point I fell in love with Sanedu is that... Um, Everywhere in Kathmandu, in architecture, in uh, sculptures, and in also uh, the iconography, I found the bull everywhere. Bull has a great mythical meaning as well as a very poetic meaning to me. So that is how I became, that became my favorite imagery. And in my plays, especially plays and po poems and um, my essays, as you said, I have used this uh, animal. But there's a note of sadness. I just want to add that this animal is under threat now in the cities. That is kind of a, so many monstrosities are coming everywhere. This animal is being chased out in a very poor shape. But that remains a very, as you said, the metonymic, metonymic figurality that still exists, the power. That is the power, the power within each of us. If we cease to love the love the sari, the bull, as a power, then we'll we'll have to regret in the future. So that it still exists to me as a power, as a continuity, as nature, as symbol, as an embodiment of myth and uh, beauty. That is that is my perception. Uh, another significant notable, which I find while reading your essays and poems and plays is this 
there's this notable called memory. I call it notable because it's very difficult to define whether memory is an element or memory is emotion, memory is a category or what I cannot, I cannot say it clearly. So I would like to, I would like to call it a notable. So memory is a significant time as well as a space in your place like uh, fire in the monastery and dreams of peach blossom. You evoke both time and space in your place. Amidst the ancient monuments of the city where the sun descends mysteriously in the winter and guards hear mysterious sound in the depth of the summer nights. I would like to know this particular nature of memory, how memory appears uh, to Abhishwedi as a writer, as a poet, as a dramatist. So that is... Thank you, Arun. You make my life easier by uh, answering the question. Half of the question you have already answered. This uh, memory that I evoke in my play, my plays are about memories. Like the, the Dreams of Peace Blossom, my poetic play that is set in Bhaktapur, where I have um, tried to capture, recall, not just the individual memory, but the community memories, memories of history, memories of art, memories of architecture also. In that one, there is try to try to dig into the memory of this girl who was married off to Song Song Gampo, a Tibetan emperor, who is considered as the great um, um, uh, heroine of uh, this country. But she had the pain. With what kind of pain did she go to Tibet and so on? And where is her memory? Her memories are inscribed. Memories of a girl, a helpless girl who gets married off, who is treated as a kind of a commodity. So that, I just try to dig into that. And I landed in the world of um, arts and uh, these old courtyards and so on, and then sculptures, and try to, uh, to find, the, dig the memory through those images, through those iconicity. So that memory was not my memory, but also part of my memory because I, I, I do feel the pain. I do feel, feel, feel ecstasy, I do feel the, agony that is hidden behind those community memories or the memories of a girl. So I wrote that play, poetic play, um, around uh, that memory. And the other play that you mentioned, uh, Fire in the Monastery, is based on the memories of the Buddhist nuns and monks who um, were kind of uh, uh, trying to become meaningful meaningful within the, within the monastery. But still they kept up the quest. The, they, they combined the memories of ecstasy, um, peace, as well as turbulence. That was a very turbulent time of the Maoist insurgency in Nepal. And one nun, uh, for example, she particularly kind of cannot forget the memories of the children. They keep haunting her. And they go out to Kailash in search of the, of the meaning, but they cannot uh, forget the memories. So they come return to the monastery once again, carrying those memories, but the memories don't um, leave them. And they, this nun leaves the monastery and goes out to meet the children and serve them. So this is kind of very complex structure of the memories. So my, um, yeah, my, my belief is that uh, uh, the memories, mythical memories are always inextricably linked, combined with the kind of um, real memories. And they make up a kind of a very, very, very um, complex Professor structure. Professor Abhishek will you be able to precise it so that uh, uh, we are already exceeding the time? Dr. Arun Gupta, yeah, okay. uh, will you be able to conclude it? Yeah, okay. th thank you very much. Yeah. I have said more or less uh, yeah. what I have to say. Professor Arun Gupta made my life easier <laughs> by um, asking such very wonderful questions and uh, in the presence of the Didi and everybody, friends and so on. Um, so I felt very grateful and inspired and I was able to say something uh, within the limited time that you have given to us. Thank you, Thank you Thank very you. much for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Aranagupta and uh, Professor Abhishubedi. And uh, we shall proceed to the next one. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hassan Al Zayed's uh, conversation with uh, Professor Prakrul Alamji uh, from uh, Bangladesh uh, may start, may request uh, 
Mr. Hassan Al Zayed to kindly introduce yourself to the viewers and so as to kindly introduce uh, Professor Fakrul Alam to the viewers. Sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, I am uh, Sharka Hassan Al Zayed. Uh, I teach at uh, the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. Uh, I received my PhD from SUNY, Albany. Uh, some years, a year ago. So, uh, and I work in the discipline of postcolonial studies. But uh, I'm here to introduce my teacher, uh, Professor Fokrul Alam, uh, who is a prolific writer, who is also a translator, and is a very well-known figure uh, in South Asian uh, literature and cultural circuit. I, uh, Professor Fakrul Alam is now the, the director of uh, Bangalundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Center for Peace. Uh, and he's also UGC professor uh, of uh, Dhaka University at the moment. Uh, he's the author of more than uh, a dozen of books. Uh, as I have already mentioned, he's a very prolific uh, writer, academic and uh, translator. Uh, Professor Alam um, has recently, in 2020 alone, he has published three books and three very different books. So uh, I'd like to actually begin uh, by making a gesture towards that prolific production uh, and just uh, begin by asking him uh, questions about uh, how uh, he got interested in translation and uh, how his academic and personal life have been influenced by and impacted by uh, his uh, translation, his teaching, and his academic research. Uh, thank you very much, Zahid. And I'd like to uh, take advantage of this to uh, thank our host, our Sahitya Academy host. I don't know his name, his name doesn't appear. And of course, I uh, give my respects to uh, Ms. Ajit Kaur, who has always, you know, through thick and thin, through COVID or whatever the situation, he, uh, year after year has continued with this uh, enterprise and all of us have benefited so much by it. Uh, I've been asked this question before, how did I get into translation? Well, my answer is, uh, you know, depends on a, it, it depends partly on a poem by Tara Podaroy. And he wrote a poem about Jiranandu Dash, the great Bengali poet. And in that poem, he says to Jiranandu Dash, because Jiranandu Dash has a poem, uh, eight years ago one day, uh, and where you know he imagines somebody uh, from the morgue come in and grip him and not letting him go. And it seems to me that, to me, that is a metaphor of what happened to me because I started reading Jiranandu Dash in the 90s. And you know, I wasn't working in in Bengali at all, or you know, doing anything or reading much in Bengali at all at the, up to that point in time. But once I had read Dion Dash, he gripped me. His poems gripped me so that I felt that I had to translate him. That I felt that I had to articulate what he was trying to say in a different language. And I had never done any translations, literary translations before. And once I had done and brought out a book on Dion Dash. Uh, Rabindranath, who is also someone who has been with me for a long time, uh, I thought I would attempt uh, this work on Rabindranath. And once I think I got to be known as a translator, uh, I was asked by other people. And at one point, uh, our honorable prime minister, who was at that time the uh, leader of the opposition, uh, invited me to translate Bangamundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's uh, unfinished memoirs. So I ended up translating three of his books, all three of, of, of his books that day. And so one thing led to another. And I would say that it all started with the ghost of uh, Jiro Dash possessing me and not letting go of me. And he's still with me and I still translate his poems every once in a while, as I do Rabindranath almost all the time. And Rabindranath has been in many ways, the centerpiece of your uh, academic activity life as well, along with Edward Said, who you worked on on many occasions, uh, and R.K. Naran, who you wrote about, 
in uh, many of your books and articles, uh, Ruminanath is someone that you went back to over and over again in your works. You're also currently working on Rabindranath, especially on his, uh, you know, song lyrics uh, from Gita Vitan. Uh, why are you so uh, taken up by Rabindranath? What does he offer to you personally and intellectually that you're drawn to him so much? Uh, two things. First of all, first of all, I grew up in a home. Uh, and I've written about this actually, where my father was, uh, his morning would start with Rabindranath. And in the evening, he'd go to bed with, uh, listening to Rabindranath Shundi, you know, the music of Rabindranath. <clears throat> and he would want us all to listen. You know, he would, he would tell the children, come and listen. So I grew, grew up with that. So I have a, an essay called Growing Up with Rabindranath Shundi, because that is the, the way I grew up. The other thing I think that happened to me uh, I didn't understand that at all at that time, was I was going through my teens in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, Bangladesh was moving towards Bangladesh, moving away from East Pakistan and towards Bangladesh. And Rabindranath became a focal point because the Pakistanis tried to throttle Rabindranath. You know, he was banned from the Bangla department for a while. And he was, uh, Rabindranath Shangit was not allowed on, on, uh, in Radio Pakistan for a while. And so that inevitably created a backlash. And all of us who were moving towards Bangladesh, almost all of us uh, in the nation, we all embraced Rabindranath. And you know, as we all know, he ended up being, you know, uh, uh, used his poem for our national anthem and he uh, animated us, he gave us a lot of incentives. So that is how I think Rabindranath became central. But what I would like to say is that when I started translating Rabindranath, because I knew the songs, I knew, some of the poems, I knew some of the short fiction. Then I realized what an unending source of wisdom he was. No matter why, where you turn to, he was. He had something to offer for every occasion, for every you know moment of one's life, uh, uh, for every uh, stage of one's life. So I will say that as I grow older, I can't have enough of him, and I would dearly like to spend six, seven years on nothing but him. I don't know if that will ever happen, but it's one of the things I dream about. Yes, since we're talking about translation, and I find uh, your movement from Rabindranath to Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujirul Rahman quite interesting in a sense that from literary translation to translation of political writings, especially prison writings. And that must be an interesting, you know, transition for you, and at the same time, deeply fascinating experience for you. So, uh, how did you? Well, Zaid, I know you don't know this, but by coincidence, today I wrote something in the Daily Star, and those of you listening can Google and uh, um, and find it out uh, from the net, and it's called uh, Bongomundu's Writerly Skills, because to me. You just have to be instinctively a writer. You must cultivate the, you know, the, the writing uh, before you can become a writer. So he might have been political, but he was very articulate. He had a zest for life. You know, he uh, had uh, he encountered all kinds of characters and he remembered them all the time. He loved, you know, the flora and fauna of Bangladesh, and they all come into his narratives. So the three narratives that we have, have all, uh, you know, qualities, which I think an artist, a novelist, for example, would access. His imagination seems to have been stimulated by that. So it wasn't that difficult a transition at all. And then of course, the first person narrative, which is also something that we all in literature are used to. Uh, he does that. And uh, if, I mean, in, uh, I think outside Bangladesh, the other books are not that well known, but in prison diaries, for example, you can see his character sketches, his sketches of prison life, his depiction of birds uh, that come and that don't come. And, you know, uh, about uh, prisoners who have such a terrible, miserable life and vivid descriptions. So it seems to me that he's very much a writer. And therefore, as a uh, student of literature, it seemed almost inevitable that I would be attracted to him. But of course, I 
started translating because I was asked to. It is only when I read him closely that I began to understood all, understand all of these things. Thank you. Uh, now let us actually move back to your current work. I know that you have just finished a book, uh, which uh, is a collection of essays that you wrote in the last uh, 14, 15 years, uh, almost since 2006. Uh, and uh, you also published this other book on essays. Uh, I know that you're very drawn to essays and essay as a form appeals to you. But let me just simply ask, I mean, uh, this new book, what is it about? Well, as you pointed out, this new book is a sequel. Uh, it, and uh, Orun talked about post-colonialism and you also talked about post-colonialism. And I think all of us are under the a shadow of Edward Said one way or the other as we look at literature and as we try to uh, get a perspective on uh, our literature from our location in space and time. So these essays are, uh, the title of the book is Reading Literature uh, from Bangladesh. You know, uh, 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 sorry, and uh, reading English and uh, literature and English, doing English studies in Bangladesh uh, and uh, with the colon post-colonial perspectives. So basically what I've done is uh, I've, I've collected in uh, it um, books, papers, and a few reviews, uh, which I was invited to write because I go to conferences. I, I like to say that I'm a frequent flyer to India because I go to conferences in India. I've gone to Nepal also a number of times as a VN. Uh, Orun uh, will testify and I think we are, Orun and Abhi and us, we have a close as, a, a association also. So, uh, and, and also abroad, I, I mean, in, in, in England and America, and I've kept contributing to books uh, all over the world. So uh, since they're scattered, uh, every once in a while, I feel the urge to be, put them together, the more, the, the, the better ones. And, so the, and, and the ones that can uh, be packed together thematically. So this is what I've done. I've, uh, this is the second collection. It's a big fat book. Uh, it's going to come out, I think, in in in, in a month or so. It's uh, all 500 pages plus. So and and, and that's, it, it does represent a lot of hard work that I've been doing over the years. So uh, I hope that answers the question. And I wonder if we have the time for any more. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, no, no, no. Please kindly uh, take uh, maybe uh, three more minutes. No problem. Okay. All right, uh, then my last question, because we have been going through this extraordinary moment, extraordinary times. Nationally, we have a lot to celebrate. This is the 50th year of our <coughs> independence. Uh, and uh, this is something that we are celebrating nationally. On the other hand, there's a raging pandemic going on uh, you know, around the world. And there seems to exist this absolute disjuncture, the celebration in the national life, which is at the same time held back by this catastrophic experience for everyone around the world. Uh, did it have any impact in your personal uh, life and writing, how do you actually look at it? I think it has had a strange impact because I've been home and I've, uh, and I've done more work this year than any other year of my life. And that is, uh, uh, the other reason is, uh, you know, because uh, this year, and this is a major reason, is the Mujib centenary, uh, you know, our, uh, the, our founding fathers 100 years. This is also the 100 years of Dhaka University. And it also is the 50 years of Bangladesh's uh, in independence, you know, existence as an independent nation. And I, because I work in English and I do a lot of editing, I'm, I've been asked to contribute essays, but mostly edit. Uh, and by now I think I've edited thousands of pages. And uh, so I'm absolutely exhausted. And I'd like to go back to Rovindranath and do a lot more reading of uh, Rovindranath at the end of the year. So next year I want to completely change, move away to uh, and focus myself completely on Rubinath's poems and plays and writing about him and reading his novels and everything that I can. I had, I've had enough of, of work this year. The pandemic has enabled me to do that, but you know, I, I also ended up writing two reviews of books on pandemic in the last six months. But this has been a very active time for me. 
Sir, thank you very much. And I also thank uh, Shaito Academy for organizing this and uh, you know, accommodating this. I'm personally grateful to uh, Professor Ajit Kaur. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ajit Ji, as always, for wanting me to be part of this. It's such a pleasure to be part, uh, part of this. And, and stay well, and uh, uh, all the panelists, and uh, our, our site academy host. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Hassan Al Zaid and uh, Professor uh, Fakrul Alamji. I forgot to now, thank. I forgot to thank Hassan Al Zaid. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sir, now uh, we shall move to the our third conversation uh, with uh, uh, Miss uh, Maryam uh, Tasanam Wahid Tatu as a conversation uh, with uh, Ibrahim Wahidji from Maldives. Uh, may I request her, uh, Tatuji, to kindly uh, introduce yourself and also introduce uh, 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 Mr. Ibrahim Wahidji to the uh, viewers. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Mariam Tisunum Wahid, better known in the Maldives as Tatu to my media fans. I'm grateful to Mr. Ibrahim Wahid Ogar to, and everybody at the Foundation of South Writers and Literature for giving me this opportunity to participate in the very first uh, South Asian online literary conference. And also my warmest greetings and respectful salams to every distinguished person taking part in this esteemed conference. I've been told about the most uh, illustrious Srimati Ajit Korji by Mr. Vahid. Uh, he has the highest respect for you, madam. Uh, and oh, also I know. I know. he also wishes to convey his love and respect to you just as he greets his old uh, friends and colleagues and co-conspirators in writing. I have Mr. Wahid here with me today. And uh, as we start this conversation, we hope and pray that this COVID-19 pandemic lifts soon and that we shall once again be able to meet and greet each other soon. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed scholars, writers, and poets, uh, Mr. Wahid is no stranger to you. Uh, he has been attending Foswal events for about 14 years now. He's a writer, poet, and a scholar of Moldavian and international repair. Uh, he's the recipient of Sahitya Academy Munshi Premchand Award in 2008 and the recipient of uh, the Sark Literary Award in 2011 and also the Maldives prestigious uh, uh, National Award of Honor for Service to the Divahi Language and Literature in 2020. Mr. Wahid, welcome. Uh, to start uh, with, I would like, uh, would you like to say anything uh, to the honorable attendees of the event? Of course, thank you, thank you very much, and salam alaikum. And before I, oh, namaskar, uh, Maji. Before I start to say anything, um, I'm going to break the rules of this conference because uh, this is a little surprise. Pichle eight no saal pehle, mene ek vada kiya tha. के एक ना एक दिन माजे मैंने आपके सामने भारत का एक भाषा में एक दो शब्द कहूं और मैंने ये वादा कर बस कर दिया दैट्स ग्रेट शाबाश शाबाश दैट्स ग्रेट दैट्स ग्रेट थैंक यू धन्यवाद थैंक यू वेरी मच yeah, uh, and I think today I can hold a, a, a conversation in um, either a mixture of Hindi and Urdu uh, with uh, a certain degree of comprehension. Having said that, uh, and in order to save time, I would of course uh, love to thank everybody who is here. It's always good to see old friends. And um, I, was, I was quite amazed to see what, what a number of people you know, have come together in it. Uh, I've seen the names of old friends like, you know, professor, uh, professors and doctors, uh, the Reverend Gallali Sumanasiri from Sri Lanka, for example, uh, you know, Alok Palla, Arundhati Subramaniam, Abhi, whom we've just had, uh, Suman Pokhrel, Keshav Sikdel, Jarna Rahman, uh, you know, Indi Nur Al-Huda, uh, Professor Fakul Alam, whom we just had, um, uh, 
uh, Selina Hussein, Mamang Dai, and so on, old friends. It will be so good to have, you know, seen you physically. But let's hope this, this COVID uh, is finally uh, through, hopefully, and uh, someday we'll be meet again. And uh, Sahitya Academy, I, I thank you so much again uh, for, for uh, you know, for this effort. At the same time, there's a little bit of uh, unfinished business as far as uh, my Munshi Prince and the world was uh, concerned. And now that I'm retired, I can take you up on that and hopefully I'll be able to uh, you know, contact the right people in your, in your uh, institute and carry on from there. Uh, meanwhile, it's, uh, I have heard fantastic notes here uh, during this session. And one of that was that we used the lockdown during you know, this, this ongoing uh, COVID pandemic. But let, let's, let's leave it at that. And uh, let's go ahead with, with today's topic. How do you feel that the Maldivian state recently awarded you with the National Award of Honor for service to the Dili language and literature? <laughs> you see, I have managed to always keep an international reputation, partly because I write a lot in English. But then I also used to write and still do uh, in my own Divehi language, the national and, um, you know, Matravasha of, uh, of the Maldives. But unfortunately, all this time, I feel that my country had ignored me. Even my old students had been receiving all sorts of awards. And suddenly, last year in December, I was quite, quite surprised and taken aback and highly gratified that my country had conferred upon me an award of honor, which is one of the highest civilian awards you can get. And once again, I feel like a citizen of the Maldives as well as the citizen of the world. During uh, the total uh, internal and the external lockdown of the Maldives in, back in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, you've published a few books online. Would you tell me a little bit about them? Yes, in early 2020, the Maldives went into total lockdown. And for a country that has a massive number of tourists coming in, that was a huge, huge blow. And I was stuck at home. I'm considered a high-risk patient. So nowhere to go at home. It felt like jail for a while. And I said, hang on, you do have a world to go into, the world of creative writing. So I went to town, decided to put the time to good use. First thing I did, compiled a collection of some of my never published short stories in the Divehi language, published it on Amazon. I said, well, that's not where I'm gonna stop. This was followed by two books immediately, double barrel shotgun style. One was called, oh God, a long, long Dewey language name. I wouldn't do that. But the two books are uh, one, Random Ramblings, one, Random Ramblings, two. A little bit of poetry, two collections, Amazon. And then I also not translated, but converted into the Maldiv Maldivian language, Dewey to suit a Maldivian language um, and a Maldivian culture and a Maldivian audience as well. Two books that I wrote, Radio Man. And then there was another one about a kite flyer. Put them on Amazon. Strangely, Amazon was a bit reluctant to um, accept the Divehi language, but finally after emails going around, they finally accepted that. And finally, uh, again, two versions of the same story something called Ahlam, uh, which I again published on Amazon and on Lulu.com. They're still there. And um, beautiful, the, I mean, the entire country received it pretty well. Uh, international reception has also been very good. I am quite intrigued about your novel, Ahlam. What exactly is the novel about? <laughs> it's something that is relatively new to a Maldivian writer. Internationally, it's this old hat. You see, I used the COVID-19 lockdown itself to set the scene for the novel. But during the lockdown in the Maldives, a very lonely man is visited uh, by a being, you know, from another dimension. And she is probably self-summoned. We are never told that. The name of this visitor is Ahlam. Every night, Ahlam brings to this man a short story. This is kind of like the Arabian Nights. And 
she goes into the various complications and sociological issues that we have in the Maldives, but not quite saying that. Now, having said that, a few, few, few questions occur to the protagonist. For example, do these problems that Ahlam brings every night, do these apply to the Maldives? Are any solutions indicated? You know, does this man who is visited by Ahlam, does he slowly slide into self-pity or even madness? Does he wake up to a new reality? Does the man actually get possessed by this being called Ahlam? Or is this a new awakening? Do we, as the readers, get insight into certain realities of life in a country which is presented to the rest of the world as an idyllic paradise for tourists to come in at extremely high rates? Or is it? Is it just that or something else? A lot is left to the readers to make their own choices on. And that's what the book is all about. Ahlam in Arabic actually means dreams. Do you think then uh, that every single one of us is entrapped in a prison of our own making? Or is it, uh, our, if our societies keep us entrapped in its own limitations, enforced or otherwise? Um, in a way, yes. But then again, if uh, one sees oneself in, in a kind of a prison of the soul, I ask this, isn't it because one voluntarily chooses that imprisonment for oneself? Or at least doesn't one imprison one's own thoughts in one's own mind? These are questions that might be asked after one reads the book and hopefully answers for oneself. So this, this is an existential question that people have been you know, dabbling about and throwing around for a few years. Sorry, who exactly is the character Ahlam, I wonder? Is she just a character or a symbol or something else? On the surface, Ahlam is obviously not here. Okay. Um, and he makes nightly visits to a man in distress. That's what the legends of the story would have you say. But don't all of us have our own Ahlams, wishfully hoped for, imagined? Could Ahlam perhaps be the very sanity that we have within ourselves, which makes us ask questions so that we arrive at rational answers? Yes? Is there a twist at the ending? I feel it creates a room for sequel. Can we expect one? <laughs> you're pretty smart. Um, you're absolutely right. There is that strange twist. Yeah, that, that, that phone call at the end, and that's at the daytime. And this is by actual, an actual physical person called Ahlam. Yes, there is a sequel on the way with a very strange twist. That's quite exciting. I don't feel like reading a little bit of the book. I wonder if we have a time for it. Um, Do we? Shall I yeah, please, read please, a please, All please, right. please take good. All right, all right. So, um, I'll start. The Honorable Council did allow him one little freedom. He could stay on the island as long as he did not get involved in whatever they called island affairs. However, since no one would take him in, even temporarily, Manik started sleeping on the Holuashi that became his home. So why don't you go away, asked Zulfa, wiping away the tears that coursed down her cheeks. She offered to help. You can come with us if you wish, sir. Thank you, my daughter, said Manik. I have reasons to stay here. In fact, I have two beautiful reasons. And the two reasons are, Jenny asked. I get to see my two daughters when they sneak out to see me. They do so rarely. And very often I watch them from a distance, going to school, meeting friends, I'm grateful that I have that opportunity. I just can't part with them, Manik said. He went on, and the second reason is that there is a small cater of young people on this island who hope that the current family gang who have a strange stranglehold on the island may be out in the next election cycle. They're working on that. They want real freedom, real democracy. 
and Zulfa asked. And until then, Mad Manik sleeps here every night after the regular wags go home. He will not go hungry as long as the Sadagat keeps coming. He is happy to catch a glimpse of his daughters. Manik expressed his ex feelings of hope. When Zulfa and Jenny finally bid farewell to their new friend at the pergola, it was almost midnight. Said Zulfa to Jenny, I want to leave this island as soon as I can. Let us call for a speed launch and get us out of here at first light tomorrow. I have a feeling that if we stay here any longer, the honorable members of the council and the secretariat might discover that the type of dementia that Manik has is contagious. And if that happens, I have no idea what ill fate it will befall us. That was an excerpt from the novel Ahlam by Ibrahim Wahid Agar. I can only wish that the sequel is on the way soon. As I conclude, I would like to thank you esteemed participants for the opportunity and I wish all of you a very successful conference. May your efforts bear uh, fruit for all of us to, with relish and gratefulness. This is Mariam Tissunum Wahid Taft signing off from the Maldives. Good evening and Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mariam Tassanam Wahid uh, Tatu and as well as uh, Mr. Ibrahim Wahid uh, from Maldives uh, for, for taking your time for this conference. Uh, uh, at the end, uh, it's my uh, duty and uh, it's a great honor for me to thank all of you, uh, particularly all the six participants of uh, this uh, 15th session, uh, right from uh, Dr. Arun Gupto and uh, Professor Abhi uh, Shubedi from uh, Nepal, Dr. Hassan Al Jayed uh, and uh, Professor Fakrul Alam from Bangladesh, and uh, the last session, Ms. Mariam uh, Tasunam Wahid Tatu and uh, Mr. Ibrahim Wahid from uh, Maldives. But I'll be failing my duty if I don't thank, uh, if I don't uh, sincerely thank uh, Dr. Ajit Kaur, uh, who is the uh, president of uh, FOSWAL, for her tireless commitment and uh, unbounded service to the, towards the language and literature. and. Um, on behalf of uh, Dr. K. Srinivas Rao, Secretary Sahitya Academy, I thank all of you for your for your unbounded uh, service. Where is Dr. Rao? I think Dr. sir is uh, in. Otherwise, he is in uh, some other meeting. That's why he could not. Uh... He had to speak. <laughs> yeah, he was going to speak. Yeah. So uh, thank uh, thanks a lot to and. Uh, I'll be really failing my duty if I don't thank all our viewers uh, who are watching all these uh, SAR conferences. Uh, thank you so much, viewers. And uh, this uh, today's uh, 15th uh, session of this post-war conference will come to an end with this. And uh, we shall meet tomorrow uh, sharply at 10 o'clock with the uh, 16th session. With this, this, uh, this session will come to an end. Thank you so much. Uh, see you tomorrow.